When Apple released the iPhone 11 Pro Max, it was successful because it delivered in areas that people seem to care about the most, with significantly improved battery life and a completely redesigned camera system. In fact, the iPhone competes with the Google Pixel 4 for having the best camera on a smartphone, and perhaps surpasses it thanks to the ultra-wide lens. In response to this, Samsung looked at every aspect of last year's S10 series and pretty much maxed out the specs in all areas of the new S20s. The S20 Plus is an impressive smartphone, and is in line to be perhaps the best smartphone released this year. Many of you have been asking for a comparison of Apple's best smartphone against not just Samsung's best phone, but what many believe to be the best phone on Android. For those wondering why I'm not comparing the S20 Ultra to the iPhone instead, well that's because, as we saw in the full review, the S20 Plus is frankly a better phone, and it seems that most of you agree with me. Apple just doesn't make a phone like the S20 Ultra, and I think the Plus model is the closest competitor, even before you look at the price. In this video, we'll be comparing all of the specs and features of these smartphone titans, covering all of their differences, and answering the ultimate question, which of these phones is better? Let's take a look. So for the design, neither of these phones made any drastic changes from their predecessors, and both still have glass front and rear panels with metal frames. The phones are pretty big, too big to use comfortably with one hand, but you'll notice that the S20 Plus is taller and narrower than the iPhone, which has implications for both how it feels to use in the hand, and also with how it displays your content. It's a little easier to reach across the screen on the Galaxy, but this may impact certain content like web pages, games and video although this narrow aspect ratio tends to better suit cinematic footage, like certain movies. Another difference in how it feels using these phones comes from the build quality and materials. The iPhone of course uses stainless steel, versus the aluminium frame in the S20 Plus, and this does give the iPhone a more premium feel in the hand. One thing that Apple have always done really well is create premium feeling products, and the combination of the higher weight and smooth steel frame does feel nicer in the hand than the Galaxy. As the harder metal, it'll also be more scratch resistant than the Galaxy's aluminium, but if you drop either of these phones, they're pretty much equally likely to break. I also prefer the softer matte texture on the iPhone's rear glass, since the glossy back of the S20 Plus can feel a bit oily, and also attracts more fingerprints. There's a slight difference in water resistance, despite the fact that both phones obtained an IP68 rating, because the iPhone is rated to 4 meters for 30 minutes, whilst the S20 Plus is only rated to 1.5 meters. The physical button layouts differ too, with the S20 Plus placing everything on the right hand side, whilst the iPhone has the power button on the right, but the volume keys on the left. As a right handed user, I think I'd prefer to have the volume keys on the right as well, but I do love the iPhone's handy mute switch, a feature I think all smartphones should have. The iPhone's single SIM card tray is located below the power button, whilst the Galaxy places its dual SIM tray on top. The hybrid nature of this SIM tray means that you could either use it for dual SIMs, or for expandable storage up to a huge 1TB, a key feature that's missing on the iPhone. Storage might be an important factor, depending on your usage. In the case of the iPhone, I feel like I've been saying this for years now, but a starting base storage of just 64GB is really poor, and should at least be the 128GB that Samsung offers, especially since you can't expand this. The one advantage is that there are more storage options available, because in some regions, such as here in the UK, you're stuck with 128 gigs for the S20 Plus. With the iPhone, you can get all storage options in any colour, which is great, but I'd much rather have expandable storage as an option. The Galaxy also has an advantage when it comes to ports, since it uses the much more versatile USB-C connector for charging and data transfer. Although rumoured to be switching to USB-C, the 11 Pro Max still uses the inferior Lightning port. The ports are flanked by microphones and stereo speakers, but you won't find the headphone jack on either phone. The corresponding front-facing speaker is clear to see on the iPhone, centred inside the iconic notch, whereas the S20 Plus manages to squeeze this into an impossibly thin top bezel, so there's no competition as to which looks better, which we'll come back to. In terms of the speaker quality though, there's really not much in it at all. The stereo separation is pretty even, and both phones are fairly loud, but I'd say the iPhone's audio is slightly more bassy, whilst the Galaxy is slightly louder. Both phones support Dolby Atmos, but on the S20 Plus you can also enable this for unsupported content, 
which does make the volume louder than the iPhone, but can diminish the audio quality. The iPhone simply enables it automatically through spatial audio for any Dolby Atmos supported content. Have a listen. The Overhauled Liberty series shows that they're serious about contending with the biggest names in audio tech. The Liberty 2 Pro not only cements Soundcore's position as a major player in this field, but are also one of the best true wireless earbuds available right now. We'll also be reviewing the cheaper Liberty 2, which are similar not only by name, but in design and features too. This in-depth review will cover everything. But getting back to the iPhone's notch, this forms part of perhaps the most important distinction between these phones when it comes to design. Side by side, it's hard to believe these phones were released just a few months apart, because the iPhone's now dated notch makes it look like an older generation device. The S20 Plus's single hole punch is a much more modern, attractive, and less obtrusive design, giving you much more screen real estate. I know that some people actually prefer the iPhone's design though, so let me know down in the comments section which one you think looks better. Clearly, there's an important reason why Apple have stuck with the notch for so many years, and that's because of the technology packed inside it. The notch houses the necessary components for Face ID, the most sophisticated, and I think best unlock system on a smartphone. The S20 Plus uses the ultrasonic fingerprint scanner we saw last year. I personally quite like it. It's positioned really well, and when it works, it can be faster than Face ID, but most importantly for me is that it takes me straight to the home screen, whereas you still need to swipe up on the iPhone. However, an emphasis must be placed on when it works, because it still suffers from slight misalignments with your finger, any dirt or moisture on the screen, and a lot of screen protectors will give you problems too. Sure, there are ways to improve this, like increasing touch sensitivity and registering your print multiple times, but it's still not as convenient as Face ID, which works every single time. But now I find myself faced with the same decision as I did two years ago. Is the convenience of Face ID worth the sacrifice you make by having the big ugly notch? I still love Face ID, but when I look at Samsung's gorgeous display design, I'm starting to think it's no longer worth the sacrifice. This is a really tough one, but let me know which one you'd rather have down in the comments section. Just in case anybody didn't know, you can actually unlock the S20 Plus with your face too, but this doesn't use a 3D image of your face, so isn't a secure biometric method like on the iPhone. It's the same technology that made headlines after users were able to unlock phones using someone's photo, so just be careful if you want to use this. Aside from the notch and hole punch, the displays are also impacted by the bezels, which are noticeably thinner with the S20 Plus. Samsung have finally decided to ditch the problematic curved displays of previous years, and now have a much flatter display closer to the iPhone. There's still a slight curve to enable those thin side bezels, so they now seem to have found the perfect balance. The S20 Plus offers a 6.7 inch display versus the 6.5 inch display of the 11 Pro Max, but there are quite a few matching display specs with the phones. There's the obvious fact that they're both OLED displays, but they also offer the same high contrast ratio, wide color range, and 1200 nits of maximum brightness. They both offer HDR support too, and content is visually stunning on either phone. I just think it's a bit easier to enjoy on Samsung's larger display with the higher screen to body ratio. The S20 Plus offers a higher 1440p resolution too, but there's one important spec that really separates the phone from the 11 Pro Max, and that's the high refresh rate. The Galaxy's 120Hz refresh rate makes using the phone an absolute joy. Thanks to iOS optimizations, scrolling on an iPhone has always been really good, but that's nothing compared to the smoothness of the S20 Plus. High refresh rate displays really need to be seen in real life to be appreciated fully. You just won't see the true benefit on a YouTube video set to a lower frame rate but those who've used them will know just how good they look. The weird thing is that Apple released the iPad Pro with a 120Hz display, but didn't choose to include that display tech in their iPhone 11 Pro, which just seems insane. The S20's display enables high refresh rate gaming too, which is more enjoyable on the Galaxy's bigger screen, although the iPhone still wins in terms of the game library. The high refresh rate is the one display spec you really need to care about, and it's a no-brainer as to which display is technically more impressive. To give the iPhone some credit, it does have a few redeeming features. For one, it supports Dolby Vision in addition to HDR10, the former of which is often considered to be the superior HDR format. The second is True Tone, a feature which automatically adjusts the white balance according to the surrounding lighting. This seamlessly adapts to your environment to offer a more natural and comfortable viewing experience, and there isn't really a similar feature on the Galaxy to compare. But the final, and perhaps most important point, is that the typical display brightness is higher on the iPhone. Despite having the same max brightness specs, 
What you'll actually see in real-world use is that the iPhone's display is brighter, so it does offer improved viewing, especially in bright conditions. An important thing to mention about the S20's high refresh rate is that this does take a significant toll on the battery life. As I said in the full review, this is still worth the trade-off, but I could often extend my screen on time by over an hour by turning it off. I still achieve better battery life on the 11 Pro Max though, a phone known for its great battery life. Using the phones at max brightness streaming 4K video, gaming, and using multiple apps to simulate an intense day of use, both phones reached around 6 hours of screen on time before the Galaxy eventually died. At this point, the iPhone still had around 20% battery, which translated to around an extra 2 hours of high quality video streaming. I do have the Exynos model of the S20 Plus though, and I'd expect the Snapdragon version to offer much better performance. As for charging though, the iPhone really falls behind. The Pro Max can be fast charged at a maximum of 18 watts in around 2 hours, but the S20 Plus halves this with its 25 watt charger. The wireless charging speed is faster on the Galaxy 2, which is able to charge with more power. It also has the wireless power share feature, letting you charge up other devices by placing them on the back of the phone. You can actually charge up other devices here with more power than the iPhone can wirelessly charge, which is pretty crazy. Moving on now to what many consider to be the most important aspect of the phones, which is the camera. Both phones offer redesigned triple lens camera systems, but the S20 Plus has additional depth sensors for enhanced depth information. There are some common themes that we've seen in previous years, such as a higher contrast and saturation with Samsung's images, whilst the iPhone tends to show more accurate and natural colour. The S20's images therefore tend to be more striking and vibrant than the iPhone, although less realistic than the real life scene. The white balance is typically warmer with the iPhone 2, which perhaps comes as no surprise, but you'll still find that this can switch between shots. The S20 Plus often produced a sharper image, a characteristic trait from a Samsung camera, but I also found the plane of focus to be shallower than the iPhone. This was actually a big problem with the S20 Ultra, and isn't nearly as bad here, but I usually found the iPhone captured more of the subject in focus. Even with the scene optimizer and other enhancement features turned off, the Galaxy tends to give a more processed and stylized image than the iPhone, which sometimes works really well. But this can lead to oversharpening, and combined with Samsung's aggressive contrast and saturation boosts, can overprocess photos. But how much you like this effect will be down to your own preference. There's also a high resolution photo mode on the S20 Plus, which uses the telephoto lens to take a 64 megapixel photo. As we saw in the full review though, there isn't really much to warrant the slower capture time and larger file size beyond the regular mode, and even compared to the iPhone's 12 megapixel lens, the contrast and colour differences we normally see are the only noticeable changes anyway. Both phones have 12 megapixel ultra wide angle lenses, but you can clearly see a drastic difference in colour. There's a significant magenta hue with the S20 Plus, and the iPhone much more accurately represents the true colour of the scene. What's perhaps less obvious to see, is the oversharpening effect of Samsung's image processing. This isn't always a negative, since you can make out more detail, such as the individual seats of the stand in the background. The iPhone's image, by comparison, is much softer, and the lower contrast means the seats in the foreground and metal bars on the roof are less prominent. The edge distortion is much more apparent on the 11 Pro Max, and you can see the curvature created by the lens if you look at the seating in the foreground. Switching back to the S20+, Plus, the seats are now parallel, but the field of view is the same, so though the softening at the edges is quite similar, the distortion impacts the iPhone much more. If we switch over to the main lens, the colour difference is still clear, but you'll now notice that the sharpness of the iPhone's picture much more closely matches the S20+, Plus. so this really highlights how the Galaxy's image processing produces much sharper ultra-wide shots. In these ultra-wide shots, you can see how much sharper the S20 Plus is by looking at the grass, but the colour is way off, and is much more accurate on the iPhone. As we move through the levels of zoom, you'd expect Samsung to pull ahead with its space zoom tech, able to zoom up to 30 times versus 10 on the iPhone. So far, we can see the higher contrast and saturation in the S20+, Plus, which we'd expect, but otherwise, the iPhone is keeping up. Remember, the S20 Plus has hybrid optical zoom, so at 2 times zoom it's still using the main lens, and unlike the iPhone, it doesn't switch over to the telephoto lens until you push the zoom further, which could explain why there's no substantial benefit at lower zoom levels. By 8 times, the iPhone is almost at its maximum digital zoom range, but I'd argue that it's really holding its own against the supposed superior zoom lens of the S20+. Plus. The bricks and wooden panelling have more contrast, but not necessarily that much higher resolution. If we max out the S20 Plus at 30 times zoom, we'd need to crop on the iPhone's image to match the zoom level, so there's one advantage for Samsung already. The image quality is clearly better too, 
but I would question how useful this sort of zoom range will realistically be. It can be pretty tough to take a photo at 30x zoom anyway, and there are few occasions where this would ever be needed. Pictures aren't exactly amazing at 30x either, and to be honest, I'm not the sort of person who uses the telephoto lens anyway, so the range offered by the iPhone up to 10 times is more than enough. As I said in the full review, I just expected the S20 Plus to be significantly better with zoom, but you really need the S20 Ultra to get that noticeable advantage over phones like the iPhone 11 Pro Max. I'm personally just not really convinced by Samsung's hybrid zoom, but if you're into 10 or 30 times zoom photography, the S20 Plus still has the superior lens. Night mode has been improved significantly with the S20 series, which now pretty much match the iPhone for performance. In these shots here, it's actually the iPhone that has slightly overexposed highlights, although the coffee bar text is more true to life. You also don't see these light artifacts on the S20's image, and this can be a fairly common occurrence with the iPhone, where there are very bright lights in a low light setting. The iPhone has however captured more detail, which you can see most clearly in the brickwork and in the textures on this wooden surface. The S20 Plus still tends to overprocess with saturation, exposure, and especially contrast, and this can give an almost cartoon-like appearance that's less realistic than the iPhone, but I often prefer the more striking image it produces. I think noise is the one area that perhaps keeps the S20 Plus behind the iPhone in terms of night mode, but the low-light performance is now so similar that it's mainly going to be down to personal preference as to which style of image processing you prefer, be it the sharp and stylized Samsung images or the more natural and realistic iPhone images. The main takeaway for me though is that Samsung now finally have a decent night mode on their phones, which can keep up with the market leaders. I should mention that there's no night mode option on the ultra-wide lens of the iPhone, whilst there is on the Galaxy, but this really isn't a big advantage since the ultra-wide lens plus poor lighting is usually a bad combination. One area where the S20 Plus simply can't compete is with video. For those who saw the full review, we picked up on a few focus issues with video, and though most of this has since been improved across multiple software updates, a few minor issues remain which you can see here in this recreation of the test. I think the lack of auto tracking when filming in 4K60 is mostly to blame. But with all issues aside, the quality of the video just can't keep up with the 11 Pro Max. Apple's iPhones are just a cut above the rest when it comes to video, and I'm yet to see another smartphone beat it for smoothness, stability, and overall quality. Stability is one area where the S20 Plus comes close, thanks to the super steady mode, but this significantly diminishes the video quality, and also limits the resolution to 1080p at 30 frames per second. The one video feature the S20 Plus can boast over the iPhone is support for 8K recording, or at least it would be if the quality wasn't so bad. Even after the many software updates we've had so far, the quality is pretty poor, it's very unstable, and the focus issues are amplified to the max. You'll have much better luck filming distant or slow moving subjects on a tripod, but even if the 8K video was really good, you've also got to consider the practicality of it. It takes up huge amounts of storage, around 3GB for every 5 minutes, and are you realistically going to have an 8K display to watch it back on? Almost certainly not. 8K is cool. Samsung deserve credit for incorporating this into the phone and for moving the industry a step forwards, but 8K is not useful nor ready yet, so just stick with 4K for now. As for the front cameras, we're looking at a 12 megapixel selfie camera on the iPhone versus a 10 megapixel lens on the S20 Plus, but again, the spec difference doesn't tell the whole story. The obvious thing to notice is that the iPhone takes the reverse image, which is how others see you rather than how you see yourself in the mirror, and this is often the reason why people don't like their own selfies on the iPhone. Samsung phones for a long time have allowed you to take either the reverse or the previewed image, and it would be cool to have this option on the iPhone without having to go into edit mode. A drawback to Samsung's camera is that you first need to disable the annoying beauty mode settings that are on by default, which try to smooth and brighten skin tones, but once you do, the results are much better. If I flip the iPhone's image for the sake of the comparison, you can see that, perhaps unsurprisingly, the Samsung photo is much sharper despite the difference in the megapixel count. It's actually a little oversharpened, a benefit or perhaps consequence of Samsung's face detection, even though all beauty mode settings are turned off. If you look at the surrounding background, there's actually a lot more noise in the S20's image, so there are disadvantages too. Still, there's no question that there's more facial detail here than in the softer image on the iPhone. I do prefer the warmer colour with the iPhone's image though, which tends to look a little more pleasing for skin tones. The iPhone also typically showed better dynamic range, and you can make out more detail in the bright material of the shirt, and also in the hair in the shadows. Switching over to portrait mode, the edge detection was pretty similar for each phone. The cutout on the S20 Plus is a little sharper and more pronounced, whereas the edges are a lot softer on the iPhone. 
This is something you'll typically see by default, but since you can adjust the depth of the blur effect on either phone, you can normally adjust these to produce similar results. These unedited photos show a pretty typical result, and I like elements of both photos. I like that the S20 Plus has a greater depth of field, so the entire face is in focus by default, whereas on the iPhone, you can see that the blur effect begins with the top of the forehead. However, the transition into the blurred background is more gradual and natural on the iPhone, whereas this is more sharp and sudden with the Galaxy. The portrait modes on the rear cameras gave similar results, with a sharper cutout on the S20 Plus and a more gradual blur with the Pro Max. Interestingly, both struggle to keep the face as the main part of the subject in focus, despite each camera recognising a face in the frame and presumably factoring this in to the image processing. With portrait mode on the main lens though, the S20 Plus was pretty patchy with its area of focus, and you can see how it's kept parts of the plant in focus but blurred the subject's legs. Testing these modes with the latest updates shows some improvement, but this can still occur. I tend to find that portrait shots look better with the tele lens though, so it wasn't a huge problem anyway. The S20 Plus did a really good job with this image of the plant though, nailing the edge detection and background blur, whilst the iPhone's gradual blur effect doesn't work as well for these types of shots. So perhaps this example shows the advantage of the S20's rear depth sensors. Front-facing video has been improved on the S20 Plus to now match the iPhone's 4K60 resolution, but again, the quality wasn't quite on par with the iPhone. The colour and saturation is characteristically a bit off, and the iPhone still wins for smoothness and stability. One thing the Galaxy does really well though is maintain good exposure levels, whereas the iPhone tends to focus on exposing the subject, which often means areas like skies can get blown out. I want to quickly touch on an important, but often overlooked aspect of these cameras, and that's their usability. There are important factors beyond just the specs on paper, such as how it feels to use the camera, a significant part of the overall camera experience. The iPhone has perhaps the more user-friendly camera, it has a more simple to use interface and no complicated menus to get lost in, so it's easier to master. But the S20 Plus has the more feature packed camera app, with added extras like the floating shutter button, more advanced shooting modes like pro mode and single take, and of course a full range of camera settings built into the app. iOS now finally allows you to change up the shooting mode from within the camera app, but you're still much more limited than on the S20 Plus. The main thing I prefer with the iPhone though is its ability to process images in real time and the image in the viewfinder is practically identical to the processed image every time. On the S20 Plus, the viewfinder and processed images can often be quite different, and it takes longer to display the processed image too. I still don't think the S20 Plus's camera is as technically proficient as the iPhone's camera overall, but the gap has definitely been closed with the new improvements. The 11 Pro Max is still ahead with video, but the photo performance is now so close that it really comes down to your personal preference of the style of image produced. The S20 Plus images look more processed, as though they've been edited automatically, and you may prefer this since this often produces more striking images straight out of the camera. Others will prefer to have more natural and accurate photos that capture a true representation of the scene that they can later edit if they choose. Either way, these are two of the best smartphone cameras on the market. Getting into performance, the 11 Pro Max is packing Apple's A13 Bionic chip whilst the S20 Plus uses either the Snapdragon 865 or the Exynos 990. CPU benchmark tests will show the iPhone comes out on top, but this doesn't tell the whole story. Samsung's Exynos chip also gives significantly poorer performance than its Snapdragon rival, so any performance gap is perhaps more exaggerated for my UK models of the phones. But either way, you're still coming up against the fastest processor in a smartphone, running software that was designed specifically to work with it. Apple benefits from combining in-house custom chips with its own purpose-built OS, and the Pro Max has the edge over the S20 Plus for raw performance. But specs on paper don't always apply to every use case in the real world, and you'll actually find the S20 Plus to be equally snappy and responsive, and often more so thanks to the gorgeous 120Hz refresh rate. The S20 Plus easily beats the iPhone for RAM management though, despite the higher efficiency on iOS that means this spec gap isn't as drastic as it appears on paper. The S20 Plus was still able to better run multiple apps in the background, and I found it especially useful to be able to pin apps to the RAM for quick launching too. Ultimately, the importance of the hardware really pales in comparison to the software, and it's the classic battle of iOS versus Android that will really separate the phones, and likely be the most significant factor into your purchase decision. For me, there's no outright winner, and there are aspects of both operating systems that I enjoy on a daily basis iOS offers a very clean and refined interface, and still does gestures better than Android. Then there are essential apps like Notes, iMessage and FaceTime which I love, 
Plus, the integration with other products in the ecosystem is best in class. But you're very much locked into this ecosystem, whereas Android gives you complete freedom. Most simply, by offering customization. You can change up every aspect of the phone, the icons, the fonts and themes, and you can make your phone a very personal device. The iPhone lets you change the wallpaper and lock screen, and that's basically it. Samsung DeX lets you use the S20 Plus as a desktop computer, and multitasking allows you to be more productive, which is especially helpful on these huge displays. This crucial difference, iOS or Android, trumps pretty much all other differences in specs and features, and that still hasn't changed this year. So how much do you have to pay for two of the most powerful phones on the market? Well, the Pro Max starts at $1099, and the S20 Plus at $1199. One important thing to note with the pricing though, is that Samsung are very likely to offer various price drops throughout the year, so even as you watch this video, the S20 Plus could be heavily discounted. Apple are very unlikely to offer any discount, and won't likely lower the price until the new phones come out later in the year. Either way, I don't think there's a substantially enough difference in price to make either phone the outright winner in terms of value. Obviously the UK pricing is better for the S20 Plus, but then again, we're stuck with the Exynos models too. We should address the elephant in the room though, because yes, the S20 Plus supports 5G, and the 11 Pro Max doesn't. For some people, this will be a really big deal. If you hang onto your phone for a few years, then you'll eventually be able to make use of those faster speeds, and it's destined to become a major benefit over the iPhone. Right now though, the coverage is very limited, even for the more widespread low to mid band networks, which only offer speeds slightly above the current 4G on a good day. You'd need to stand a few feet away from the millimeter wave masts to get those insane download speeds that give 5G all of its surrounding hype, which obviously isn't practical. 5G simply isn't ready yet, and it's too early to analyse the true benefit. As I said back in the 11 Pro Max review, I don't mind the iPhone not having 5G, but for those who are looking to buy long term, say 3 or 4 years, then the lack of 5G support may be a problem. Even by the time the new iPhones roll around, the 5G network still won't offer widespread coverage, but having said that, I'd be surprised if Apple didn't offer 5G phones next time around. Overall, I find it tough to personally choose between these phones. I prefer the camera and battery life on the iPhone. Apple have really nailed the basics, and it's probably the more practical choice of the two. But the S20 Plus, with its beautiful high refresh rate display, just feels like a much more futuristic device, and I think is the more exciting smartphone. For me, it's too close to call. But who do you think won this battle? Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.